everyone. I just wanted to hop onto Zoom and record this video really quickly, um, just as a check-in and also to go over some of the more complicated um, concepts of this week's lab. If you don't get to this video, that's okay. I just thought I'd put it on here both as a study tool and just as a check-in point. Um, I wanted to quickly say that as we're approaching spring break, this is a really good check-in point. We just finished our midterm last week. Um, if you missed any of your assignments um, that were earlier in the class, and I'm referring to pre-labs, post-labs, discussion posts, this does not apply to the midterm. Um, if you are missing any of those assignments and you want to make them up for that partial credit, please let me know. I'm happy to open that for you. Just go ahead and email me and let me know which assignments you need opening. And I'm happy to unlock them for you so that you can complete those. There's no reason not to complete them. Um, I don't mind if you turn it in late. Of course, there will be that late penalty. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that you can submit late work. I'm happy to open it up for you. You just have to communicate with me. That being said, if anyone has any other concerns going forward in the class, please let me know. Um, that final exam is going to be approaching quite quickly. So please just keep that in mind. Um, and if you have any questions, just go ahead and email me or message me on Canvas. However you want to get in contact with me, I'm happy to um, work something out with you. Okay, so that being said, I'm also going to do a quick little like lecture about our Mendelian genetics from this week. I know this can be kind of a more complicated um, lab or just concept in general. And I'm sure you're also getting some information from your lecture class, but in case it's not completely lined up properly, as I know it often is not, um, I just thought I'd get on here and lecture a little bit about Mendelian genetics. Okay, so what really is genetics? Genetics is the study of heredity. Um, so this is which involves um, specific traits, and this could be eye color, hair color, height, skin color, are all passed down from one generation to the next. And these genetic traits are inherited by uh, are inherited in specific and very predictable patterns. Um, there has been a lot of science that has studied how these traits are being passed down. Of course, this is Gregor Mendel, and he studied these from this very very famous um, study with pea plants, and they were looking at color and whether or not the peas were wrinkled or what co um, color the um, flowers were and everything. I'm sure you've all heard about it. But yes, that's where this Mendelian genetics um, all came from. Okay, so what exactly are genes? Genes are the basic functional, functional units of heredity, and they are sequences of DNA that contain the instructions or basically the code that is needed to produce certain traits because DNA codes for proteins, which then um, give us our physical traits that we see um, in genetics. A genotype is the genetic makeup of an organism. And I'll show an example of that in just a minute. And the phenotype is the physical characteristics of that organism. So phenotypes and genotypes go hand in hand. Um, and the phenotype is just the physical, what we can physically see of the genotype. Um, so a phenotype would be the green eyes um, or it could, and the genotype would be the code which produces those green eyes. And that'll make a little bit more sense in just a minute. We also have what are called alleles. Um, an allele is basically a term that describes the alternate form of a given gene. And that might sound confusing, but I promise it'll make sense in a minute. So if you have two of the same allele, for example, they're typically expressed in letters. So let's say we're using the letter B. If you have two lowercase b's, um, which code for a specific gene or a specific trait, that's what we called a homologous, homozygous um, allele. If you have different alleles, so let's say an uppercase B and a lowercase B, that would be called a heterozygous. So here's that example right here. So we have two um, genes right here, two alleles. One is a big A and the other is a big A. So we call that a homozygous and we would call that dominant because typically uppercase letters um, correspond with dominant genes. And over here we have a big B and a little b. And this is called heterozygous because they are different. Homo meaning the same and hetero meaning different. Okay, so alleles can be dominant recessive, as I just said. An allele is dominant when the trait it controls is expressed in an individual. So typically brown eyes is a really good example of a dominant trait. Um, it, it overpowers the allele for blue eyes. So um, again, a lot of those dominant traits are expressed by a capital letter. And recessive alleles are alleles that are only expressed in the absence of that dominant allele. So like I said, brown eyes are dominant over blue eyes. Blue eyes are only seen when they are homozygous 
for the blue eye trait because they are overpowered when the brown eye trait is present. So if you have brown eyes like me, you might carry a blue um, eye allele, but because you have like one allele that's for brown eyes, that it overpowers the blue eyes and that's why you express brown eyes. And eye color is much more complicated than that, but that is the simple form of how this genetics works. And yes, recessive alleles are typically expressed with lowercase letters. Okay, so we now have brown eyes. And how can we necessarily, um, what are the different alleles that could be for each of these phenotypes? So these alleles will make up our genotype. So if we start with on the left, we have brown eyes. And this brown eyed person can have big B, big B. This is the genotype. The two letters together are a genotype. And that could be homozygous. Or someone with brown eyes can be heterozygous, but because brown typically is dominant over blue and it has big B, little b, that is going to be heterozygous, but they'll still have brown eyes. And the only way you can have bl blue eyes in this case is if you have two lowercase or a homozygous genotype for recessive traits, and that is little b, little b. Okay, so if we have two dominant parents, they're going to give off a dominant offspring. And if we combine a dominant and recessive parent, they're also going to show a dominant phenotype offspring. But if we have two recessive parents, like if both your parents have blue eyes, you're most likely going to have a recessive offspring. So they will also have blue eyes. Now, how do we predict these different phenotypes? So we have what are called Punnett squares, and Punnett square is basically a tool that you could predict both the genotype and the phenotype of the offspring produced from a genetic cross, is what we call it. So we have to define the genotypes or phenotypes of the parents first, and that's how we are able to predict the offspring. So if we know the genotypes and the phenotypes of the parents, we can predict what the offspring might have when it comes to phenotypes and genotypes. So again, we'll go with the brown and blue dominant and recessive alleles. And there are three different types of genotypes, as we've already discussed. The homozygous dominant, which are the big B, big B. Heterozygous, which is big B, little b. And homozygous recessive, which is little b, little b. So if we have, this is a Punnett square, if we have one parent that is heterozygous, which means that they have one allele for the brown eye gene and one allele for the blue eye gene, so big B, little b. And one parent that is homozygous recessive, meaning they have two little b's, so little b, little b. Um, how will this, what are their offspring most likely going to look like, right? So what we start is we start in this, in one of these boxes, and we basically take one allele from one parent, put it into a box, and the other allele from the other parent and put it to the same box. So if we start with this box right here, we take the dominant uh, brown eye gene and you put it in this box, the recessive blue eye gene and put it in this box, and you do that for each of them. So going on to the next one, Again, you're taking this brown eyed gene and dragging it over here, and this blue eyed gene from up here and dragging it down here. And you do this for each of the boxes. Again, little b over here, drag it to the center, and little b up here, drag it down. And what we see is that we have 50% chance of the offspring being brown eyed because we have this these heterozygous genotypes right here and 50% chance of the offspring being blue-eyed because we have that heterozygous, I'm sorry, homozygous recessive genotypes right here. Now, in this case, we have 50% homo homozygous recessive and 50% heterozygous, but there's, and then that corresponds with 50% um, brown eyes and 50% blue eyes, but there is a chance that we will have not necessarily the same ratio for both phenotypes and genotypes. And as you can see here, so the genotypes are 50% heterozygous and 50% homozygous recessive, and phenotypes are 50% brown eyes and 50% blue eyes. Now, if we did a different cross with different parents where we have two heterozygous parents, well, how does that look different? So again, we're gonna start up here in this top left corner. We're going to take um, one allele from one parent, which is the big B, and one allele from the second parent, which is the, uh, another big B. And we have one box that has um, big B, big B, other known as, otherwise known as homozygous dominant. And then we'll move on to the next box right over here. And that one is going to be heterozygous. It's getting the big B brown eyed allele from parent one and the little B blue eyed allele from parent two. 
And then going on to this third box, we have the same thing. Little B brown, I'm sorry, little B blue eyed allele from the parent one and big B brown eyed allele from parent two. And lastly, taking the little bees from each parent, we have a homozygous recessive in the fourth little square. Okay, so this is a little bit different from the last one. So we have one, two, and three squares out of four that have a dominant trait in them, which means that there is a 75% chance that the offspring will have brown eyes. However, there is one box that has the, the homozygous recessive trait for blue eyes, which means that there's a 25% chance that their offspring will have blue eyes. However, it's important to remember the phenotype versus genotype. So that 75% of brown eyes and 25% of blue eyes is how we describe the phenotypical results or the phenotype results. But if we're talking about the genotype results, we're asking a different question. So the genotype is what specific traits do we have? So we have one box that's homozygous dominant, 25% chance that the offspring will be homozygous dominant. We have two boxes that are heterozygous or a 50% chance that the offspring will be heterozygous for the eyes trait. And one box that is homozygous recessive, meaning that there's 25% chance that the offspring will be homozygous recessive. And so when we summarize these results, we have two different answers again. So genotypes, 50% heterozygous, as I just said, 25% homozygous recessive and 25% homozygous dominant. But when we're talking about phenotypes, which is just the physical appearance of what these genotypes are coding for, we want to just know there are 75% chance that they're going to have brown eyes and 25% of blue eyes, because the only one that's going to be able to show the recessive genes is this one box down here. So many scientists do genetic experiments to be able to track these genes. Um, and a lot of these studies involve fruit flies. There are many labs on campus here at CSUN um, for master's students that study Drosophila melanogaster, which are fruit flies. They're really good organisms to study for genetics because they are short-lived. They easily grow in a lab. Um, they look a little bit gross, but they're easy to grow in a lab. They have really fast life cycles. So we can look at many, many, many generations of fruit flies, see how those traits are transmitted over many generations, but not necessarily wait that long because it's not human life cycles where we live for 80 years or so. Um, they also give off a ton of offspring. So we have a lot of data that we're collecting. We're able to see um, how many of those offspring are getting these specific traits. Whereas humans, we're only really typically reproduce one, maybe two offspring at a time. Um, they also have really distinct and well-defined phenotypes, meaning that they're really easy to see. Um, like the, these red eyes are a trait. Um, they also have like white bodies versus black bodies, things like that. So here we go. Again, <laughs> what I was just saying, very distinct phenotypes where you're able to see all these different traits, like the red eyes right here, black bodies, black eyes, white eyes, all these different traits that are really easy to distinguish and be able to see the differences over generations. Right, so wild type. Anyway, that's not really that important, but if you're really interested, you can pause the video and take a look at all the different um, ways that we've been able to change the genetics of these flies over time. Okay, so that was a monohybrid cross. Um, so a monohybrid cross is meeting between organisms that have different alleles for a single gene of interest. So um, wing length and fruit fly is an example of this. A dihybrid cross is meeting between organisms that have different alleles for two genes of interest. And you can do this basically for wing length and body color of fruit flies. And I'll get into that in just a second. So a dihybrid cross is again a Punnett square, but it looks a little bit scarier than the one that we just did. The one that we just did was a monohybrid cross. But if we're looking at um, fruit flies, and we wanna look at wing length and the colors of their eyes, we have one parent with homozygous recessive for wings and one parent, I'm sorry, and also a heterozygous for eye color. And then another parent that's heterozygous for both wing length and eye color. This is how we do a Punnett square for them. So we basically wanna take all of their um, alleles and we're going to break them up into separate little parts. So we take, um, this W. So we want to take this first one and we're going to pair that with our second trait that we want to look at. So we have little W, big B, and that's going to be our first genotype that we're going to put into our Punnett square. Then we're going to take that same W that we were just looking at, pair it with the other trait. So little W, little B, that's going to be the second genotype that we're looking at. 
And then we're gonna do the same thing, but move on to the second W. So the second W, we're gonna pair with this big B again, causing showing this genotype. And then same with that second W, with that little B over here, with showing this um, genotype. If you remember in like algebra, when you had to foil out an equation, this is the same type of thing. So you're really just carrying over and making sure you're making all the combinations for that parent. Again, so we're gonna just combine all the different alleles with each other within one parent. And we're gonna do the second, same for the second parent. So big W with the big B showing this genotype right here. And then big W with the little B showing this genotype right here. And lastly, the little W with the big B, this genotype, I keep losing my cursor. And then little W, oops, all right. And it's not showing, but little W with a little B showing this genotype right here. Okay, so then we put those basically all onto a Punnett square. So we have parent one right here and parent two right here. And we're gonna do the same thing as before. It's just a little bit bigger. So we're gonna take these alleles right here, put it into this first box and these alleles from parent two and put it into the first box as well, which is gonna show a big W from parent two going here, a little W from parent one going here. And then the same again, but for the Bs, a big W, I'm sorry, a big B for parent two going to this first box and a little B from parent one going to that same box. And you're just gonna do this for all of the boxes, just grabbing each of those traits and throwing them into the boxes. And we can just go all the way across. Um, and that is how we complete a dihybrid cross. It feels a lot more complicated than it is. Now, obviously interpreting this is a little bit harder. So if we take a look at just um, this half of the dihybrid cross, we can see that all of these have big Ws, which means that we, we know that all of these offspring in these eight boxes are going to have long wings. And then we also have in this row, including this box down here, we have five boxes that are going to have black eyes because we have the big Bs present in all of these boxes. And then in these three, we have all red eyes. So we know that these are all long wings and this half is all short wings because we have only little Ws over here. And then when we look at eye color, these all have black eyes, these five right here in red. And then these three blue boxes are going to have um, red eyes. And then these orange boxes are going to also have black eyes. And these green boxes are going to have red eyes. So what we can conclude from that is that we're going to have five out of the 16 offspring that are possible are going to have long wings and black eyes. Three out of the 16 possible offspring are going to have long wings and red eyes. Five out of the offspring are going to have short wings and black eyes. And then three out of the 16 of those offspring are going to have short wings and red eyes. And we can um, make those into percentages as well. We also have what are called X-linked crosses. Um, so a lot of organisms will have traits that are specifically linked to the X chromosome. And we already know that um, female versus male um, organisms have different types of chromosomes. So for a female, we have two X chromosomes. And for a male, we have an XY chromosome. So when a gene is located on the X chromosome, it's called X linked. You've also might have heard it as sexed linked. And a gene for eye color is located on the X chromosome in flies. So if we look at an X-linked um, Punnett square, and let's say we're looking at green eyes versus hazel eyes, we have for one parent, two X chromosomes, meaning this is the female parent. And we have, a, again, this is still heterozygous for the eye trait color. So we have one X with the dominant green eye trait and one X with the lowercase hazel eye trait. And then the male um, parent is going to have only one X and a Y. And that Y cannot hold this trait. It's only linked on the X, X chromosome. And this is a, oh my gosh, and this is a dominant trait linked here on the X chromosome. So when we go and solve this, we're just gonna do the same thing as before. It's not more complicated than it was before. You just interpret it a little bit differently. So we're gonna take this um, allele, we're gonna put it into this box, take this allele and put it into this box. And we're just gonna do the same thing for all of these. And it looks different because half of our offspring are now going to be the male possibilities and half of them are going to be the female possibilities. And the females of the female chromosomes, the XX chromosomes, 
we see that there is a 50% chance of homozygous dominant and a 50% chance of heterozygous, which means that both of them are going to have green eyes, but their genotypes are going to be different. And down here, we're not going to have homozygous or heterozygous because they, this trait is only on the X chromosome and males only have an X chromosome. So we have X and Y and 50% of the male offspring can have green eyes and 50% can have hazel eyes. And if you're familiar with colorblindness, this is how colorblindness mostly occurs in males. That recessive allele is much more likely to be shown because it doesn't have the other chromosome to basically overpower if there's a dominant trait. So it doesn't matter if you're homozygous, recessive, hetero or heterozygous because there is only one. So if you have that recessive trait, it is going to present itself on a sex-linked or an X-linked um, trait. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so our phenotypic ratio for this was one to zero because they're always going to have green eyes because that dominant trait is overpowering because there's no homozygous recessive in this specific cross. For males, it's one to one, and that's specifically because there's only um, one X in this cross, and so that recessive gene is really coming through stronger than it would in females. Okay, so that is all I have to say for today's lecture. Hopefully that made things a little bit easier to understand. If you have any more questions, please let me know. I'm happy to address any questions. Um, and yeah, if you have any late work that you wanna turn in, please email me. I'm happy to open up any of those late assignments, except for the midterm. Um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your week and a good spring break. See y'all later.